a the UCL Energy Institute on a on a on a miserable day. So thank you for, for walking through the array. Um, I've actually got the speaker's bio on my phone. I'm not actually checking my messaging while I'm trying to get you to send that's just in case uh, you think I am. Uh, but uh, um, uh, before I, I introduce our speaker, as ever, uh, we have some um, housekeeping just to, to uh, tell you about. Um, there is no fire drill planned, so if you do hear a fire um, alarm, uh, please leave the building. Uh, the nearest exit um, is behind you, the door that you all came in. Um, after the um, seminar, then we invite you to uh, join us for a glass of something, a nibble of something, which will be in the uh, Jevons room. Sorry, we'll be in the kitchen next to the Jevons room, which is on the first floor. There's lots of UCL people, so just follow the crowd. Please stay and join us for uh, drinks and, uh, and discussions. Um, you can stay as long as you like until the wine runs out. Certainly is a good time to leave. But if you do leave after 7 o'clock, uh, please ask a UCL uh, a, a staff member or student uh, to let you out the building because it's, uh, um, um, uh, um, uh, the doors will close at 7. There are lots and lots of UCL people there, so it should be hard for you to find someone uh, to let you out. Um, with um, those housekeeping um, out of the way, um, um, I'd like to uh, um, introduce um, our speaker uh, today, uh, Dr. Evelina truth Am I saying that better? You do. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Thank I, you. I didn't always say that, that so well. Um, it's always a pleasure to introduce our speakers, but it's a particular pleasure when it's one of our own. And uh, Evelina is a research associate here at the UCL um, Energy Institute, um, where she works on the boundaries of a number of things including energy uh, systems analysis, modeling, scenarios, institution governance. I'm sure that you will um, uh, 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 tell people more about some of those things um, uh, as you go through your talk. Um, Evelina um, um, came to UCL from ETH uh, in Zurich, where she got uh, um, her PhD at the group that I, I didn't realize it was called the Natural and Social Sciences Interface Group. I think that's a great name for a young research group. Mm -hmm. Um, Evelyn has also had visiting positions um, at Albo University in Denmark, University of Oslo in Norway, of course, and the Lithuanian uh, Energy Institute, as well as working as a, as a power and energy consultant. So a, um, a really a stellar background, and I'm sure a stellar talk. So please, uh, Evelyn, over to you. Thank you very much, Neil. Very kind. Um, good evening, everyone. And actually, thank you very much for coming because the weather is really not the best today. And so sort of thanks for finding time and finding all the way here. Um, before I actually um, start my presentation, I would like to say what you already heard from Neil is I've actually been to the UK only for one and a half years now. So what I'm not going to present today is 20 years of experience, expertise, 20 years of research in the UK. It's actually um, one and a half years doing this work part time. So what I would like to ask you to do is to look at it a little bit like to a research vision. It's a vision for future research rather than completed work through years of years of uh, refining it and um, working on it. And if you read the abstract of my talk today, so you know that I'll um, look at the past UK scenarios. I'll also try to model the past. However, what I ultimately want to explore with this presentation is the way how we view the future and how we model the future. And in light of all the discussions, whether you know, future analysis, future scenarios is science or art, um, I'd say it really does not matter. What matters is that there are some decisions that need to be made today in the UK with respect for its energy system. And for that, we really need to be wise in foreseeing the future so that we can anticipate what um, impacts our decisions will have, whether they will, or policies, whether they will bring us where we want to be. So I think there's really, we need to learn it, how to uh, wisely look into the future. And when I'll speak today about, you know, looking at the future and so on, I'll actually use this very, very simple example of a oh, view of the future as a trumpet. So I borrowed this term from Scholz and Titia, um, future as scenario trumpet. And so the further we go in time, actually, the more the, the, the range of potential futures gets broader and broader. And why so? So now I borrow another graph from Nick Hughes. Um, so if we stand here today in the current system, current energy system, so perhaps the system tomorrow won't be very different from the one 
that we have today. And if it is different, it probably we can already guess why it would be, or we can anticipate it. However, the further we go in the future, the more decisions will be made, more external uh, new developments will happen. So there are all those branching points that um, extend the range of potential futures the further we go in time. So this is very stylized way of looking at the future, but I'll use it again and again to illustrate some of my thoughts. Um, and in order to answer this question, does cost optimization approximate the real world transition? I'll start by looking quite broadly actually at the um, past UK scenarios. So I'll analyze the past UK energy scenarios. And I was actually wondering whether someone knows or would like to guess when were the first energy scenarios developed in the UK. Would you like to guess? Don't be shy. <laughs> Yeah. So actually, I would have thought that you'll guess, you know, 1950s, 1960s. Well, um, the fact is that the first UK energy scenario was developed in 1978, just after the first um, oil crisis, which actually illustrates the fact that we need scenarios the moment we need to make decisions. So until then, we already, UK had the energy system already, but there was no really need to look at it. But the, the, you know, when the vulnerability of the system um, came at risk, um, there was interest of anticipating the future and may for be to be able to make um, decisions. So it all actually started with um, at the UK back then Department of Energy who were preparing their green paper on energy as response to the first oil crisis in 78 and and they were quite explicit in their aim saying that uh, with this scenario they aim to set out the government's energy strategy and they would like to they welcome feedback on it so they would like comments on it um, so they used um, extrapolation they called their scenario a forecast um, and they also stated that they looked at a wide range of possible futures which I find it a little bit funny considering that there was one scenario that represented a very wide range of potential futures. Um, so here for instance I depict the scenario now for the uh, primary total primary energy demand on the UK as a whole. So that's their scenario now I'll be kind of plotting other further uh, other studies on top of it. So as they were so explicit asking for feedback on this um, and the scenario, so there was a range of uh, other scenario studies that sparked afterwards. So there were a large number of, of actually different organizations providing their views. And I'll just show a couple of them, more prominent ones. So one that was, um, uh, was one was done by the International Institute for Environmental uh, for Environment and Development in the year 1979. Um, so it was led by a person called Gerald Leach, which I'm sure some of you might know, actually. So it was a very influ influential study and very influential type of thinking for those days. And they were actually as well very explicit as they say, they were saying, we aim to present a different view of the future, especially different to the one that was, uh, that the UK Department of Energy uh, suggested. They wanted to show that there can be, um, they can have a, an economic growth, but at the same time use less energy. So it's really very much a response to the UK's Department of Energy scenario. And they also used back then a novel approach of bottom-up model with focus on conservation and renewables. So here they had two scenarios, low growth and high growth scenario. Um, and here they are plotted and compared um, with the UK Department of Energy scenario. Then also um, another example is um, Friends of the Earth. So it's, I'm sure you know them, an environmental NGO. Uh, so very much an activist group. So they presented their view of the future and they were much more visionary and aspirational to counter, you know, to counterbalance the UK's Department of Energy scenario. So they really thought that UK can have econ economic growth and have a very low primary energy demand. 
So what you can actually see here is, you know, now I'm taking this scenario trumpet idea, and you can see that different organizations, they are here in colors, they are actually very much presenting a very um, wide range of potential futures. And just a thought on it, actually, it's, it's nice to see that, especially by looking at the different views, even if those views are very extreme, you actually can get a wide range of futures covered. So UK Department of Energy then updated their, you know, their scenarios in, in light of various discussions and uh, various other scenario studies. So it was again still an input for the green paper. They probably, my feeling is, were criticized for having one scenario and so they felt like justifying the themselves saying these are not predictions of what will happen necessarily. So they used the same method, ex uh, extrapolation, and they still stated that they provide a broad quantitative framework of consideration of energy strategies. So in light of all those uh, scenarios I showed before, so that's this very broad quantitative you know, consideration of the future. So you know, they kind of um, got closer to um, the center of all other scenarios. And what I think, to some extent, what is happening here, and, and I do once in a while see some evidence of that also, you know, in, in research today is something I would call scenario verbal. So even if we have very broad, very different views, through discussion, through kind of, um, you know, feedback to each other, we narrow and narrow down because we don't really, perhaps to some extent, don't really want to necessarily keep those extreme views. And however, it does narrow our understanding of what potential futures can be. And I think there's always a need of caution at that point. So that's what I think happened here from this wide triangle of trumpet of potential futures. The wide range of the Department of Energy considered was actually quite narrow. Then in the year 1982, actually, the first UK energy systems model was built. Um, which was called Birmingham Energy Model, and it was led by a person called um, Stephen Littlechild, that I'm sure some of you know as well, because I'm told he was the first head of, of Optium, so a very prominent person. And what he actually did is, um, so he went to the US and saw that um, back in those days, there was the first um, energy system models developed you know, in Europe and in, in the US. So for instance, if you know Markal, which is an energy system model, so here I have user manual version two, which is year 1983. If you would like to have a look at it afterwards, you can do it. So it was state of the art research back then. So he went to the US, he came to the UK and he told, look, the state of the art research is to develop energy system models. So let's do one for the UK now to support our decisions and policies. And so it was a cost optimization model and it aimed to compare optimal strategies for the UK energy sector under various assumptions. And it was, it was not neither Markal or Times, but it's a similar type of a model, cost optimizing model. And I assume that some or many of you probably know what cost optimizing energy system models are. But if you don't, I would actually like to invite you to look at the UCL Energy uh, Institute website because we have a website of Energy Institute's models. And there you can see you know, a range of various models we have. So one of them is, for example, Markle that was used um, quite a lot in the UK. And it is a cost optimizing model. And here I just wanted to show you the definition and you can read more about it. Um, so it aims, so such a model aims to minimize discounted energy systems cost under a variety of physical and policy constraints. So from a wide range of possibilities one has in the energy system, cost optimizing energy system models likes for the solutions um, that have the lowest cost under different constraints. So now back to the Birmingham energy model. So that's the kind of, um, that's the range of futures, that's their scenarios, four scenarios that they've developed with the model. Um, interestingly enough, so the most actually extreme scenario is no nuclear scenario. Just because actually the previous scenarios, none of them really considered a non-nuclear case, but in between the Three Mile Island uh, accident happened, so there was also this rush in the UK energy system, 
for energy expert is to look for, you know, what if there's no nuclear? So it opened up a little bit this whirlpool I was just talking about. Um, so now back to the trumpet. So if, if these are the gray lines, if you can see them, so these were the other studies. However, the Birmingham energy model, which is a you know energy system model, it does did cover a very wide range of futures. And I think that's although it's a very small s sample of scenarios I'm looking at, it's something worth noting because you know energy system models are often criticized for being linear and perhaps not very, you know, they can't model the radical transition or something, all these types of arguments. But in fact, they, they can and they very much can model, like their results can be very much of non-linear nature and can have a very broad range of futures that they would cover as compared to other approaches. So now I hope by now I, was, I got you wondering, so what was the actual transition? <laughs> so maybe I give a second or two for you to make your own guess uh, silently what you th where you think the future was. Perhaps you know. So the actual transition was pretty much in the middle. And um, perhaps by chance, I mean, that, that, that's how it was. And um, so now if I, p I put all those you know, scenarios separately, and now I added f two later energy projections of the, in the UK. So you can see that different scenario studies were, so the black is always the actual transition. So they were kind of covering all the, diff you know, they were um, all around the um, actual transition. None of them really got it. Does it matter? Well. Not necessarily, but what, what I would like to note again is that this energy system model had the really widest range, which is quite a contrast that then lots of people argue sometimes. So even if, if some of the models managed to get the overall trend of this primary, total primary energy demand, let me now look um, a little bit in detail to, you know, that they, they also managed to capture the detail of it. So here you can see actually the actual, you know, the year when more or less they started modeling. This is the actual, trans the actual data in the year 98. And these are the different scenarios from the different studies in the year 2000. And you can see that, well, it's different, but there are some kind of systemic um, um, patterns in it. So one is, in all the scenarios, there's lots of coal. And that's very natural. It's, it's something called unknown unknowns. So back in the day, they really did not anticipate environmental concerns, whether it's about air pollution or climate mitigation. So coal was seen as a you know, fuel that is right for producing energy. However, there was also something I would call unexpected knowns. Uh, so almost none of the scenarios really considered gas, uh, natural gas, especially for electricity production. Because in those days, um, I'm told that uh, gas was seen too good a fuel to be used for electricity generation. And while we do have a range of different studies, none of them really thought, so they knew the technology by itself, however, none of them really s saw it you know, in 10 or 20 years playing any ro major role. However, Birmingham Energy Model um, actually did have a case, the unknown nuclear case had a little bit of gas, so that's one of those kind of, um, if I could argue that's again this a little bit scenario whirlpool effect where you know through discussion and feedback our scenarios we narrow down to some kind of consensus that gas is not the right fuel for electricity generation and models energy system models can you know can show such cases where gas would be used for electricity generation so they are valuable to a little bit open up our minds and not to uh, narrow down in some consensus. Then I also, what I also looked at is I looked at the key parameters that they thought will really shape the very different futures, what they thought are the key aspects that will lead to different futures. And so these are the different studies and it's very much the case also today. So all, um, most of the studies have something like low economic growth and high economic growth, still growth scenarios or, you know, different oil prices, I'm just saying that's how they develop different scenarios. And then I also looked whether, you know, the actual 
how, how those parameters actually turned out to be. And as you can see in the case of Birmingham model, they actually, all those key parameters that they thought, um, uh, you know, can shape the energy future, they, they through their scenario approach, they pretty much got them right. So, um, so what I would argue is that happened that perhaps it's not, this is not, you know, the obviously in a model there are so many other parameters, but it's still perhaps not necessarily the uncertainty, the real uncertainty is not necessarily where we are looking at. So let me come back now to this uh, trumpet again. So what I think might be happening, and that's what I'm trying to inquire with my presentation and my work, is so if you if you have a wide range of futures, this trumpet of wide range of futures, so your model always will cover a small set because you can't model everything and you know foresee all little bits and pieces. And then you have one set of assumptions in it, you know, so you s have certain demand and certain um, oil price and so on. And then you cost optimize, you perhaps find, uh, you know, from all the space of possibilities, you find one scenario that you are looking at. Then you say, okay, now I'll run the case with the um, low oil price or very high oil price. So you have another set of assumptions, you again optimize, so you find another cost optimal scenario. Then you forget it all and then you keep it only the cost optimal scenarios. And you cover the range, however the future is somewhere perhaps in between but not necessarily. But it's not what you really, um, you know, what you could really see by cost optimizing. However, if, as in the case of this Birmingham energy model, if you did get the parameters right, if you had the right parameters in it, but it does not mean necessarily that if you would cost, if you would have cost optimized, you would have gotten the right solution. Maybe it's under the same parameters. Your actual system was somewhere else, and that's what I'm going to look at now uh, in a bit more detail. But let me sum actually up to here because I'll move further with the next study. So in contrast to what I say, lots of common agreement. I would say that. From this small set of studies I analyzed, I can, what I can see is that cost optimizing models can cover a broad range of uh, energy futures, especially as compared to other approaches in, in contrast to what is often thought. One has to be cautious of the, about the scenario of Whirlpool because through discussion, feedback and so on and so forth, we just narrow down, we build consensus of what the future might be and we are very surprised when it's not like that. And actually models can help to open up a little bit this, can show us some um, combinations or futures we haven't thought of, perhaps. Then even if we would get perhaps all the parameters right in our models, it does not mean that if we look at the cost optimal scenario, we would have gotten the uh, actual transition, right? So eventually the question is, does cost optimization approximate the real world transition and to what extent? Because we know costs matter, but perhaps not all the way. So that actually brought me to the second piece of work um, I did trying to model the past, um, past UK power, se power system, electricity system. Um, so if, you if you'd like to see more details of that, there's actually a conference paper and that way you can read a little bit more. So before I show it, actually, let me a little bit reflect on, you know, why do we cost optimal in the co cost optimize in the first place? So in mathematics, engineering and management science, that's uh, since early 19, uh, since early 1990, it's a well-established approach. You know, if you need to design a power um, plant and you have a range of various options, you would try to find the least cost option so that you can, you know, that will lead to lower costs of your pro products and so on and so forth. Now, for those who are actually um, guests of you here to UCL, I want to um, show, show you know perhaps what um, Jeremy Bentham is, who is the founder of UCL, and so he lived in you know around uh, 1800, and um, actually he was the first person who used the words minimize and maximize. So he found out the words and that goes even earlier than the you know cost optimization technique itself. 
And back already then he thought it's actually a good idea to, for, for instance, minimize the costs and maximize the benefits. So it's something, as a type of thought, it's very much a long tradition of thinking of, you know, trying to minimize, maximize, optimize. Now if we go to energy systems modeling, there are two interlinked approaches why you would cost optimize. So one is, comes more from planning, uh, and it assumes that there's a social planner. So there's a single decision maker that aims you know, for the best to everyone in society and tries to maximize the social welfare, so both producers and uh, consumers. However, in reality, such uh, single decision maker that has a power, it does, mm, such a power, it does not really exist. Look at the UK with so many players um, and so on. Another um, argument for cost optimizing is, comes more from economics, so it's partial equili equilibrium argument, saying that the demand and supply will be at equilibrium once um, total surplus is maximized. However, crit um, critics of uh, classical economics, they would also say that systems are not necessarily always at equilibrium. So to this point, I just want to show a little bit. So there are really good reasons why one would cost optimize, but perhaps not all the way, you know, that cost optimization does not necessarily, everything is complete in there. So why the real world transition would not be cost optimal? And I actually have a blank slide here, not by mistake, um, because it's not the first time I'm presenting this. And I know that everyone finds, can name huge range of reasons why the real world transition may not be cost optimal. And I'm sure you, you, can, you could easily fill this slide um, very easily. Let me suggest some thoughts. Um, so one is, for instance, energy system is a complex system. So there are so many elements that are interlinked. And it's very hard to steer it to a single optimal um, um, case you'd like to steer it to. Also, there are unmodeled objectives. So your model does not have lots of um, variables, lots of, you know, cannot model at all. Whether it's, if it's cost optimal system, it might not perform so well with something like air pollution impacts or maybe even something that can, it can hardly be modeled, like uh, social acceptance or, or stakeholder interest, which is my st another point, because you know, the real world, world transition is very much shaped by stakeholder um, preferences, interests, their discussion, their strategies, and so on. So there's all these you know, reasons why it might not be cost optimal. So actually, in, in light of all of all this, you know, optimal cost, um, cost optimal, non-optimal. What I've been doing for uh, some time now, I was developing this model expanse, and I'll talk about the dynamic version of it, which stands for ep exploration of patterns in near optimal energy scenarios. And I would say it's a good model um, because it has four features. and. So it builds, as the first one, it builds off something old and really well established. It's a bottom-up technology risk op, uh, rich cost optimization model. So it's something that has the same structure as Times or Markle or many other models. So it's built on something widely used, well established and so on. However, it also has three um, other features. So it can systematically explore near optimal scenarios. Um, it can look for patterns in this because there are lots of a large number of near optimal scenarios so it can look for patterns you know try to learn wh wh what's how the near optimal scenarios look like and it can also look for develop a small set of uh, maximally different scenarios because there's so many scenarios so you need to perhaps have a small number of them to really analyze so let me show a little bit how it works so what I would like to uh, present today is um, actually not trying to model the future, but I'll, I'm pretending now that I'm living in the year 1990 and I'm trying to you know, model the next 40 years. So it's pretty much what we do today. If we model from 2010 to 2050, so I'm just modeling from the year 1990 to 2030. So I have 20 years of the past and 20 years of future that is still to come. And what I did, I actually used the, as well, as precisely as I could find the historical data. So the actual data of, for example, electricity demand, actual plant retirement, power plant retirement data, 
as precisely as I could find um, actual cost and technology characteristics. I assumed, you know, in 1990, I don't yet know about, uh, although the climate debate was, was starting already, but I assume I don't yet consider it um, very seriously. So I'm just, um, yeah, I'm trying in 1990 to think about the future. And just let me kind of tell it once again. So I assume that in that year, I guessed almost all the parameters right. So I guess the, I knew the costs right and demands right. So all data that I would feed into a cost optimizing model, I assume I, I, I got them right. I managed to guess them correctly. So how does the expense works? Um, so you start by, like any other model, you start by finding the cost optimal scenario. So the scenario with the least cost and under, you know, different supply demand um, constraints or technology data resource constraints costs and so on and here i'm i'm afraid now you probably you can't really read it i'll try to read it for you so here so that's the um, cost optimal scenario the modeled one it goes from so on the horizontal axis you have years from 1990 to 2030 and that's the installed capacity of different types of power plants by, f by fuels. And you can see that in the case of, um, so this near optimal scenarios would have had, you know, quite some coal and then uh, nuclear, uh, the gas, deployment of gas power plants would start in about 1915. Uh, so would um, onshore wind power plants, and there would be a lot of import. Was reality like that? Well, not quite. Um, so there was, as you know, the dash for gas in the UK in the 1990s, which um, shaped the whole, you know, portfolio of power plants quite differently. There wasn't, so the offshore wind also took off um, as modeled, but there was less and less coal in, li in, in light of environmental concerns and so on. And so yes, my cost optimal scenarios, even if I would have had all the parameters right, would not be, would not be able to really repl replicate this um, actual transition. Perhaps it does not matter. I think what does matter is that if I look at the total cumulative cost in 20 years, so the total system costs, the actual transition was 17% uh, more costly than the cost optimal pathway. So perhaps the cost optimization is not necessarily a uh, you know, um, the right way to, you know, narrow down the, to, uh, you know, to, to develop your scenario. However, it's 17%, lucky, I mean, it's, it's not 100%, it's not even 99%. So it is, it's somewhere, you know, it's somewhere not too far, I would say, but, so it's not directly the opposite, but it's not cost optimal, precisely. So then what expands does, it can actually explore this near optimal space. And that's, you know, one of the reasons why I used, I prefer this model, in fact. So how you would explore the near optimal space, you add something called slack. So for example, you know, you allow some deviation in costs. So I would say, for instance, that total system costs can be 20% higher than the cost optimal scenario. And then I use efficient random generation technique to uh, develop a large number of scenarios because there are really lots of uh, near optimal scenarios. And let me just say it again because I know it never, it's never too little. It's actually the same set of assumptions. So it's the same parameters, everything is the same. What I'm varying is this deviation from cost optimal, from in cost, you know, I allow some deviation in cost. While the technology specific cost demands are all constant. Um, so how does efficient random generation work? Um, did I, have I been speaking for 45 minutes already? No, you been speaking for half Oh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> it's wrong here. So let me show how it works, this efficient random generation. So um, imagine there's a system with, a very simple system with four uh, types of power plants. Uh, solar, gas, nuclear, wind. And I don't see, uh, don't show wind because it's only three dimensions I can depict. So if we would need to supply, you know, we have a certain demand and we need to supply it with these types of power plants. If we would add all the technology constraints and so on, we perhaps would get a cube. 
It's not necessarily a cube. I very much simplify, um, but it's just an example, you know, how it would work. So this would represent all the space of combinations of these technologies to supply the demand. So it's, there's, and there's really lots of combinations, you know, 10% gas and 20% solar, or 15 and 5, or 15 and, and so on. So it's always 100%, see. If I would cost optimize, uh, um, I would get only one point in this whole space. So that's a way to narrow down this whole space to one point. So now what the, uh, the expanse does, it's, so I assume the slack, I say that my cost should not be higher than 20%, for example, than the cost optimal solution. And I, you know, all the more expensive um, scenarios, I just don't consider them. And I look only in this space of all feasible scenarios that are in the range of near optimal scenarios. And there are really lots of possible, like really still very lots of scenarios. So the difficulty is how do I actually learn what kind of scenarios and uh, how do I understand it? So by this efficient random generation technique and there are various techniques to do it, I actually, what I try to do is I try to sample the vertices of the space because by you know, knowing the vertices, I can kind of understand what's in it, what's inside the space. So let me show, I know perhaps this is a little bit complicated, so let me go th again through the same procedure now with uh, you know, another format, so with this trumpet. So now I, I have the expanse model and I, I'm completely aware that it cannot cover you know, the whole range of potential futures. So it can cover a small range and a set of assumptions I consider and I already think, you know, I know that I got the assumptions right. So if I would cost, uh, find a cost optimal solution, I would find one solution. So what I do with the expanse is, you know, I say, okay, that's another scenario that is, um, you know, there's a limit kind of the, bo the bound that my scenario should not be more than 20% costlier, more costly than, um, than the cost optimal scenarios and there's still a space, so there's lots of scenarios within it. So I try to get as many scenarios, uh, extreme scenarios out of there, you know. And I do hope that actual might be somewhere in between those, because it might, you know, it's, it's not near optimal, but it's somewhere in the space of this close to near optimal. And when I speak about many scenarios, so that's many. Um, so that's, for example, 1,000 scenarios depicted in terms of investment costs from 1990 to 2030. And you can see, so it's this 20% deviation do you remember that the actual deviation in the actual transition I found was 17%, so I bit rounded it up to 20%. So you, you do get really lots of variation in it, um, in this 20% deviation. So it's not a minor difference. And then, yeah, the, the, the challenge is, you know, how do I kind of learn what kind of scenarios are in there? So one, th um, one technique I use in the d expanse is trying to look for maximally different scenarios, for, so for a smaller set of scenarios that are as different as possible in their um, elements. So how I would do it, so if you remember again this cube, so if I have the cost optimal scenario, and then I have lots of you know, vertices already sampled for the efficient random generation, so I try, um, I find the second scenario which is the most far, you know, by, by in the way it looks, from the cost optimal scenario. Then for the third, I, I tr you know, by using um, a specific metric, I look for the third scenario that is as far as possible from these two already selected scenarios. And then I can kind of iterate it until I, you know, as many as I want, and they will be all more different than you know from all the already selected scenarios. So let me show an example of it. So that's now, again, this model cost optimal and actual transition. And um, so for instance, the first near optimal, uh, maximally different scenario that I would select would be something like that. So it would have lots of nuclear and oil. And do remember there's no, um, you know, it allows some deviation in cost and it's, so it's not cost optimal and it's no climate change concerns and so on. Could it be? Well, it could. Uh, in total system cost is not much more different from cost optimal pathway than the actual transition was, a little bit different. 
Um, another scenario, for instance, would see lots of gas or lots of nuclear and biomass, so I didn't have here biomass constraints. Um, another scenario, so you do actually get really lots of variation in this near optimal space. I would say even unexpe unexpectedly a lot. And that's something not to, you know, I would hope, well, I would think that cost optimal scenarios should not really gloss over around this, over this uh, variance in what might be in the near optimal space. Another way to look at it is actually to um, look for patterns in, the, because it's large numbers of scenarios, to, so to really try to kind of use data mining techniques, statistics, visualization to understand what kind of scenarios are in there. Um, and here I, I just want to mention there was this workshop in March we had at UCL, Energy Institute on Innovative Scenario Techniques. And I do feel it's a rising field or, or expanding field, developing field of um, in energy research, in environmental research, because we can generate so many scenarios now with our model. So how do we really l understand, you know, wh what it means and so on. So we had a workshop at UCL on that, on discussing those methods, how to work with large numbers of scenarios. And if you do want, um, so we actually, you know, the presentation slides, abstracts, a report is on the website, so do look at it if you would like to see what kind of discussions are in there. So that's a little detour. So if I look in, in the results of the expanse model, so I have 1,000 scenarios. It's now scenarios, so that here, I'm sorry a bit for, for, the, for the graph. So it's here it's again installed capacity values. Here, for instance, in the year 2000, so across this 1,000 scenarios, the contribution of different technologies of coal, oh, of coal in different scenarios actually would vary quite a lot. So by looking all, again to the cost optimal scenario, we don't necessarily see all this variation. Um, and the same for other technologies, you know, but perhaps something very expensive technologies like wave, they never appear because they are very expensive. So they would push out the scenarios from the near optimal space. Um, if I would have, you know, in 1990s, if I would have had, if I would have used uh, the expanse model and looked at the near optimal scenarios, would I be able to capture the real world transition? Would the actual transition fall into, you know, this installed capacity values? It actually would, except the nuclear, but just because for, for this maximally, for looking for maximally different scenarios, I allowed 20% deviation, while the actual transition was 17%, had 17% deviation. So it's, there's a minor kind of difference. But I would have managed to encapsulate it. I wouldn't have necessarily uh, get it right, but I would have managed to kind of see what's the potential range of different technologies. Okay, so let me sum again, and it's not much actually left. So, um, so there are really lots of good reasons why one would use cost optimization to uh, model the future energy system transition. And if you remember something from this presentation, remember Jeremy Bentham and that he thought minimize or maximize is a good idea. Um, however, if we think about the future energy system and cost optimize, we do not necessarily capture the real world transition that is to come. And there's a 17% deviation I could, I measured in the year 1990 and um, to uh, 2010, which is not a lot, but it's something. And there's really lots of uh, variance that can happen in this kind of, with such kind of deviation. So if I would, if I would look into near optimal scenarios, I would be able to encapsulate the real uh, world transition, given that I had a large enough deviation. And therefore, I would say that future research needs um, to learn to, you know, when we think about the future energy transition, to learn to navigate this really wide range of potential futures where that are both cost optimal and near optimal. And then there's another whole um, field of different parameters because we don't necessarily know the parameters, right, when we think about the future. Um, so let me now kind of a bit reflect what it means for modeling the future and why it matters. So, you know, at the beginning of this presentation, I was arguing uh, that, 
no, we don't need scenarios if we, d if we don't really need to make decisions or if we don't, or if we can allow ourselves to make a decision that is not very wise. However, we do need to be able to anticipate the costs of different technologies or the potential role of different technologies and so on. So I won't actually present results of trying to model the future. I'll now use, again, still those trying to model the past just to illustrate some three points why I think it's useful to look at the near optimal space. So first example would be the total system costs. So in this near optimal space, here I have the graph that you've already seen on the investment costs. But you can see, so if you allow some deviation in total system costs, um, so in the UK now we say, okay, by 2020 we need a certain amount of billions to invest in the energy system. And that's one number, right? However, in fact, um, you know, if you would look at, given all the parameters, you get them right. If you would look at to near optimal paths, you would get quite a range actually of different possibilities. And that I think is not to um, underestimate. Another example is again, the graph you have seen is technology deployment. So again, if we just cost optimize, we, you know, we kind of get certain values of what's the, how different technologies would be deployed. However, again, there might be quite a range. You know, this is not so big, but in, for some technologies, there can be quite a big range. And what is interesting, actually, that cost optimization does a little bit um, underplay the role of more expensive technologies, such as, I don't know, solar or something like that. So there are some scenarios that are still near optimal based on the, depending on, you know, what else is in the electricity generation mix. They can play some role and, you know, are we not really kind of um, potentially underestimating their role when we look only to cost optimal scenario? Because in the cost optimal, that's zero. Um, another example would be the option value example. Um, and I don't have a complete example either, but if I would, you know, if I would run this model now from 1990 for the cases with and without nuclear, um, and that's again the investment costs. So I would get quite a different spread of, you know, how much would be would need to be invested by then. So when you evaluate option value of different technologies, you just do it with total system costs, not investment costs. But what this means, so if I would try to um, compare them, uh, so what this would mean, let's say, you know, investment cost by the year 2010. Um, so the case with nuclear. You know, it's it's higher. It's clearly it's higher because uh, nuclear was in lots of, um, you know, also in the cost optimal mix and so on. And the and the case without nuclear, I think it's mixed up actually. Um, it's different. However, the key point here is that if you try to compare these two values, you know, if you would uh, evaluate the option value, you might get a certain, you know, a certain large value. However, they are not necessarily that different. So there are so many very similar um, cases. So these are just three examples why this would matter, and I th that's why I think we would really need to look at the near optimal space. So let me now sum up, actually, um, and finish the presentation. So does cost optimization approximate the real world transition, and is it useful to use for, um, well, does it approximate? Let me first ask that. Um, not necessarily but it can still provide a good tool to understand the potential range of futures. And there's really not much we can kind of other tools we can use for that. Um, I would though argue that uncertainty ag around cost optimizing rational is at least as important as the parametric uncertainty, but we have been so much kind of looking at the, par you know, what if we have different parameter values and we didn't look at what if we don't cost optimize. Um, so if we would look at near optimal scenarios, I showed with my example of retrospective modeling that we would be able to at least encapsulate this uh, real world transition. There's still some you know, difficulties in that, so what's the deviation one could allow? So. And thus I would argue that future researchers needs to look also to near optimal scenarios and I've been doing my contribution to that by you know, developing this the expanse model that um, looks at near optimal pathways or scenarios 
but also to this IQCN workshop where kind of learning how you know there's so many scenarios in the future how do we uh, manage to find patterns in it and actually that's it so I'm sorry if I'm a little late but that's it Thank you so, so much, Evelina. Uh, I should have said that I'm, I'm Neil Strack and I'm a <laughs> link team who does cost optimization modeling here at UCL. It's fascinating meeting one of my colleagues uh, uh, a challenge us. Um, I'd like to open it up uh, now for um, uh, uh, comments uh, from the floor. And all optimal or near, near optimal co uh, uh, comments are both brief and a question. <laughs> so uh, please, if you could uh, raise your hand. Um, and if you could also say who you are. So please, the lady in the back. Um, so in those energy system models, like Expanse or Markle or Times, it's all the costs are there. So it includes investment. If you up, you know, if it's total system cost, and discounted system cost. So it includes investment, uh, fixed and variable operation and maintenance costs, fuel costs, um, so on and so forth, as well for the future carbon price and so on. So it's all costs. Marianne. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, so if you have, you know, in, in a cost optimizing model, you have constraints and then you optimize the cost function. So that's the first run of expense. It happens exactly the same way. The, all the other runs with near optimal. Um, so I take the, co you know, cost optimizing function and uh, convert it into a constraint. So it becomes a constraint saying that I'm looking for energy system com scenarios that are not more expensive than this or that and um, and then this I use this efficient random generation techniques which kind of there's a systemic but random way of constructing a new objective function which allows you to e end in all those different vertices so cost in other words cost becomes a constraint and I have a new objective function that kind of generates me and then I run it for every for every scenario, Rio, I run it again and again and again, and I get different and different scenario every time. <coughs> I show you. Uh, I haven't actually. It's a really good idea. Didn't cross my mind until now. You see, still this one and a half years problem. <laughs> I'll do. I'll do check. Tristan, Tristan Smith, UCL. 17% seems quite small. How are you confident that it's not uncertainty in your cost data, even if you're doing this retrospectively with the benefit of hindsight, that is what you're observing and, and not just the rationale for the Mm, true. So if I had m lots of time, what I would really love to do is to actually look at everything all together, you know, to add variance in different parameters, and variance around, um, you know, cost optimizing or near optimal pathways. And also another thing is, you know, whether, I mean, when we run models today, we run it with cost expectations, so the costs we expect and there is data on actually what they expected cost to be in 1990. So I could actually also do that. Lots of more work. But um, yes, I, I, would, I would really like to, um, to look at it. Um, 
Yeah, so I haven't, like, um, in this historic retrospective modeling case, I just kind of assumed that until, you know, 2010 or I think 2015 or 20, there's no really CCS that can play a role. So I did not, because I tried to kind of have the, um, to replicate, you know, use the actual data. So it was not really most of the time available to really deploy at a wider scale. I think, you know, when modeling the future, yes, that's one of the, I would see it a lot, or to some extent also as a parametric uncertainty. So, you know, different performance of different technologies. So it, what I would argue, you need to look at both, you know, parameters and um, uncertainty around cost optimizing, tool and then you still know that the future might be you know broader as the scenario trumpet and you probably won't cover necessarily at all. I would, I'd like to use my position as a chair to ask a last question and it's about policy so I'd invite Alec Waterhouse from there if you want to do a comment on this and the question is what should policymakers do with this near optimal idea because on one hand <laughs> It gives them um, um, a view of a, of a solution that they may have not seen before. And on the other hand, it's really hard to make policies, make decisions that involve lots of money and, and are risky. So, I, I, I mean, how, sh how should policymakers use this? I think it's something I would see a little. I think it's something that needs more thought, you know, to really, because it's cost optimizing is good because it, it gives you, a, you know, one a couple of solutions that you really can go through and really comprehend quite easily. Models like the expansion gives you really ranges, you know, so you really need to kind of learn to think, you know, that there might be really lots of different uh, options and so on. So it adds more complexity to it. So it, it has a little bit of a um, downside. However, I would say, you know, you could test policies on that model. Y what you have to know is you might not get um, you know, an answer like option value of technology X is 8 billion, you might get it that it's from 3 to 9 billion, but that's all, I mean, to some extent, I think it's also about developing better policies in a way that you are much more open to really a broader range of futures that are as likely as the cost optimal one. You don't have to, Alec. <laughs> <laughs> I would say three things, really. One is that when we look at the tax forecasts projections in the future um, recognize the, uh, the codes of uncertainty in that maybe some of the attempt to model that by looking at Monte Carlo simulations and altering the parameters that go into that. And we don't use the same techniques as you, which are fascinating. Uh, the second thing I think uh, is that is, uh, we're, we're, we're interested in modeling uncertainty and then looking at government po uh, policy uh, as a way, a strategy of dealing with that set of uncertainties rather than, uh, I think naively, we might be in the past thinking about a single point and then dealing with that and then thinking, oh my God, we, if we've got it wrong, mm -hmm. then uh, things go really good. So if, we, if we're modeling to actually help our policy colleagues understand the range of uncertainty such that they can make policies that deal with that. Yes. Um, so I'm thinking of, um, uh, what's it, um, contracts of difference, for example, uh, but like that sort of behavior where we know that there's the future's uncertain, but we can actually uh, design a policy that copes with that level, with copes with that level, so to a sort of degree. And I think those are, those are a few things that I think are, are worth thinking about. And then I was interested when you were saying, uh, when you were talking about modeling and uncertainty, you said that all of those features are equally likely. I didn't know whether what you were actually talking about even the likelihood of all of those or not. Because uh, I just said you to I was trying to ask the question really as to uh, how you were modeling, how, or whether or not you've got any idea of, uh, of different degrees of uncertainty away from this. Because it seems to me we were mm. checking the objective function rather than what we were doing was looking at the uncertainty on the input parameters. Yeah, may I respond to yeah, that? We, we, we have one last question, but please. Um, let me answer from. Um, so, uh, you know, um, when I told equally likely, I think they're all, uh, it's not necessarily equally likely, but they are still likely not because necessarily they are cost optimal, so they can still be likely. Um, when you mentioned Monte Carlo runs, um, so the expanse model, it's, and Monte Carlo runs, they address com two different types of uncertainties. So Monte Carlo runs would be run with, um, you know, different parametric values. 
with expands, you get this all variety of choice by using the same parameter values. And what you allow is just the difference from cost optimization. So it's, I think the best would be to you know, overlap the two and really you, you would have much broader range of futures. And then it's about you know, learning how to work with it. And um, decision making. So uh, actually let me just here mention again this uh, IQC in workshop that I showed innovative scenario techniques that we had at UCL. So uh, I think that that's a growing field on learning how to um, how how do we make decisions how do we draw patterns how do we improve our understanding with this range of large you know large number of scenarios and one of the ways so we had probably six seven themes you know and ways to look at it but one of the themes was also um, robust decision making so trying to make decisions that are perform fairly well until all the range of potential futures you are considering. And I think that's, that's just kind of, you know, the next step you would go uh, after. And yeah, I, I met him actually last week, yeah, yeah. And we had a person, Rob Lampert, coming from Rand Corporation in the US. So there's, uh, yeah, there's, um, uh, yeah, it needs to be learned how to do it. So if we have two quick questions, <laughs> the gentleman in front, and then you want to ask one. Uh, I'm Ron Rahman, I'm member of the Energy Institute. So in terms of where you would fit this in from a policy perspective, DEC have uh, publicly available scenarios, the DEC 2050 pathways, and last I checked they were going to be developing a, a cost function within that, and I would have thought this would plug into that as one place to then test policy, because They've already got their scenarios for technology deployment, you can optimize that. Mm -hmm. The bit they were trying to build in next was to cost those scenarios. Mm -hmm. So this I mean, plug into that. Yeah, could be. I mean, it's even this, um, what's it called, the DEC 2050 calculator? Yeah. So and yeah, add it on. So it's post hoc assessment, but so there because people can you know form the, the scenarios they like, and some people would form scenarios that are overly expensive just because they really want lots of renewables in it or something like that in it. So what the, the expanse allows you to do is actually um, yeah, it's it's trumpet and yes, but I mean I think it's also at times you know when different people organizations say you know we can have this radically different future. But I would say it's costs still matter. So we might not get the future that is completely, I don't think we would get it completely, you know, the opposite of cost optimal on the other end of, you know, the whole spectrum. So you would get it somewhere not too far because costs matter and the expanse allows you to kind of consider uh, it. So finally, brief question and a brief answer. <laughs> So would say you were doing Monte Carlo and you were exploring parametric uncertainty just around cost, or you're exploring the cost, the, the uncertainty around cost optimization. How different do you think that final option space would be? Because they're both sort of dealing with cost and uncertainty, but one is looking at, as you said, parameter, the other is uncertainty. Yeah. But could the result actually be very close or yeah. very different? I think that's an excellent question, actually. And so there's a person in the US called Joe Dakarolis. And to some extent, he was actually arguing and able to show on kind of stylized uh, US energy system model that if you would do something like the expand, so if you look at the near optimal scenarios, you would actually cover really lots of parametric uncertainty cases too. So he was almost arguing you can a bit replace it one with the other, you know. If you look at near optimal scenarios, you don't need to necessarily do all the Monte Carlo runs and parametric uncertainty. I would say it's perhaps, I mean, it's also a bit intuitive. It's perhaps not all the way you can replace it. So I would say you would get different futures and they overlap and they, you know, don't overlap in some cases. So I think, yeah, if I had more time, I would love to look at that, you know, to really how they overlap. Uh, join us upstairs for a glass of wine, but first uh, join me in thanking Evelina one last